welcome to the Friday Night in a Space talk. Today, the event is called Finding Inspiration Anytime, Anywhere. So we find inspiration in nature, in art, sometimes in problems and failures, in other people's stories, in talent, um, sometimes in a crowd, maybe even in the shower. So inspiration, if it is everywhere, how to develop the art of noticing it and not being immune to it. If inspiration can come at any time, how, are we, how can we be more receptive to it? And what happens if there is no inspiration to be found? Is there something I can do about that? We're going to be asking our speaker, Dr. Kim Cunio, to share his insights on what fuels our creativity, our ability to access inspiration, our motivation, how it sparks joy in our lives. And he's going to share some of his tips on how he also is inspired. Dr. Cunio is the head of the Australian National University School of Music. He is a researcher, composer, and performer who specializes in traditional music, anthropology, and acoustic ecology. He has scored for opera, theater, orchestra, as well as television and the big screen. Kim, over to you. Thank you. I'd like to start by saying, uh, you know, the most hearty good evening to you, Artie, and everyone at the Inner Space team in, in Common Garden. And isn't it fitting that we're talking about creativity in a place that has really some of the greatest creative acts in the world? At, at, well, in this world, anyway, we can say that it's a home of opera, it's a home of ballet, and it's a home of so many performers and thinkers and makers of things. So I'd like to start by doing something that is very Australian, because... Um, in my role at the Australian National University, we've realised that we have a really important job to do, which is to, to address really what's happened to the First Nations of Australia, which is some of the, the oldest continuous cultures that we have and can define. So I'd like to start by, from my place in, in Australia, here in Sydney today, I'd like to say that I'm acknowledging that I'm here on sacred, traditional Aboriginal land, and that this land was never ceded to, to the settler colonialists who came, often with very good intentions, but incredible suffering happened to the First Nations of Australia. And in my work and in my personal life, I'd like to be part of a world that makes it better for them. And I'd also like to acknowledge that there were First Nations people really all around the world and many have had similar things. And of course, we've seen the plight of so many First Nations through COP26. So that's my quick introduction. And I wanted to thank you, Artie, for for talking about our topic already, in some ways I feel that there's nothing to say because you've, you've talked about it so well, even just in these little nuggets, that you've said that, yes, we can all be inspired, but something seems to happen that maybe we doubt ourselves or we doubt this process of inspiration or something else can happen that we come up against things that make us, make the act of creation really, really hard. Or sometimes even we doubt the world we are in. And so I wanted to talk about that and I also wanted to talk about something that I don't talk about so much in my working life, which is the notion of what spiritual values can do for ourselves as creators in this world. So I'll start by just telling you a couple of things about myself. I have a day job, which is running the ANU School of Music. We're a community of about 700 tertiary and pre-tertiary. It's not one of the biggest music schools in the world, but being the Australian National University, it's a place where not only do we teach people to play in orchestras and to become opera singers, we, but we also teach them to be researchers and thinkers. And, um, you know, it's that thing about premier universities. The ANU was really founded to be the Harvard of the South. That was its initial idea. So it's modelled really on the great universities of the world. And, of course, in the UK, you have many of them, so you'd know that feeling. But that said... What I've noticed time and time again, being with some of the smartest people in the country, because, you know, I literally bump into, you know, world-leading astrophysicists or world-leading biologists and people who are doing the most incredible work on gender, that's my daily life, bumping into people who have literally an intelligence that is almost stratospheric. But I have noticed time and time again, and I'm sure you have noticed it, that no matter how smart we are, 
no matter how nice our house, no matter how nice our family on paper, all of us will suffer. Let's repeat it again, that no matter how much we try and control this world, no matter how good we are, no matter how fun we are, no matter how creative we are even, we will actually have times where we suffer. We might even have times where we have to look at the dark night of the soul. And yet, it's okay. It's okay because somehow we always get through it. And part of that getting through it is to say that if life isn't always easy, life can be creative. And I believe strongly that if we realize that we are not immune from this notion of suffering, and we could go back to the words of the Buddha, the, this notion of the Four Noble Truths that are defined so long ago by the Buddha given to his you know, senior student Ananta, and the first noble truth is that life has suffering. And then we go to this notion that actually everyone has suffering. And then we move to this notion that we can overcome that suffering. And finally, there are things we can do to overcome that suffering. Now, that's my 10-second guide to Buddhism. But what I'm probably more interested in for all of us is what does creativity mean for us as beings? The first thing I'd like to say is that I believe all of us are born inherently equal you know we might say you can do this iq test or that test of creativity or passion and you know this person's extraordinary but actually if we were to zoom out and be you know sort of super beings that look down on the human race a bit like the way we would look at goldfish would we find any remarkable differences i have a feeling not let's even look at the notion of bodies you know now, we had the Olympics this year, and, you know, you see all these amazing young people with these sort of incredible bodies, right? And they swim fast, and they run fast, and they're amazing. We just have to look at that person's body 30 years later. It looks pretty much the same as any other body. Isn't that funny? So even the most incredible body sort of becomes like every other body. And as we know, that babies all look very similar, and older people at the end of this life also look very similar. So it's like we start... And we finish this life in a very similar manner, which is alone, isn't it? You know, we, we have to, at some point, come to terms with the fact that the crucial experiences of our life, we, we have maybe an enforced type of solitude. And thinking about that, we start to think, hopefully, about two things. One is creative expressions to, to really be ourselves and find out who we are, because that seems to me the point of creativity. It's not just to make things and become famous, but it's to actually go on an authentic journey into the self. And the second one is, if we know that all of us might well suffer, we owe it to ourselves to plant the corn in the good seasons for when the harder seasons come. And part of that is, well, I would say there's three things, and creativity is in the centre of it. But I would say that we need to look after these bodies with all their problems. If we're not smart enough to say, well... If I know that if I eat um, hot chips every night for a week, I'll feel pretty bad. Well, if I was to do that every night for 20 years, I'd feel really bad and I might well have diabetes, for example. So, you know, we don't have to be particularly intelligent to know that. But yet, with all our intelligence, we might still do that. So we, we're not as smart as we think we are, are we? And then we get into notions of if we're going to look after the body and we're going to eat better, we'd better sleep better. We'd better start thinking about how it is we get a good eight hours sleep a night. And the sleep researchers tell us that it's impossible to be creative in the long term. This is a really good point, right? You can go on the sort of, or it's almost like the binge eating version of creativity by just sort of going hard for a week or two weeks or a month or even six months. But inevitably we burn out through that. Long term creativity is through eating well, sleeping well, and looking after ourselves. And I would add one more thing. I personally find the role of physical exercise to be vital. So that's sort of first stage of looking after the self so we can be creative. The second one, please excuse me there, I would like to suggest that all of us, and Artie and I were speaking about this before, all of us do have traumas we deal with. And uh, I have a colleague in, in Australia. Um, we have our National Institute of Dramatic Arts, so the Australian version of RADA, and at the ANU we do some wonderful projects with them. And Stephen Sewell, who's one of Australia's great writers, talks about the fact that writers write out their trauma. Isn't that an interesting thought? Now, so we have that notion of processing the big things that happen to us through making art or through creative acts. But I'd like to say that there's a softer, 
and maybe a gentler way to do this as well that maybe doesn't create quite as much pain and I would say strongly does not mean we will not be able to create those big works if that's what we feel we have to do in this life and that is the process of sustained contemplation and meditation which allows things to come up. I think we all know that feeling maybe it's the feeling of when we've worked too hard in our jobs and we get towards time when it is for our little holiday and what happens we're ready to do all of these things and we get the flu and we've all been in that situation and that's because we before we can be creative things have to right themselves the pendulum actually has to swing back to the center and it swings back to the center by going like that but meditation allows the pendulum to do less and maybe just for an instant to be still before that happens again. But maybe the second time, that goes on a little bit less. And we get back to this a bit quicker and it lasts just a second longer. And maybe a thousand times later, instead of going like that for 20 minutes when someone criticizes me or my creative work or whatever happens, I just go like that and I start to go, oh, I don't really believe I have to buy into this. I can just get on with my life. And I'm like this. So I believe that all of us have this power because if we were to look at ourselves like we look at a goldfish we would say all of us as a species by and large have the same capacity for creativity now i wanted to tell you a little bit about some research but first i'm going to ask you to humor me and do something with me and i'm going to share my screen and i've got actually some words by a very interesting 12th century mystic called hildegard of bingen 1098 to 1179 it's a long time ago but I wanted to give you one of, it might be a prayer, it might be a statement or a provocation. I'll leave it up to you, but I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to read the first two lines and then I'm going to ask you to read those, that prayer, which is quite short, with me. So I'm sharing now and then you'll see that come up in just a second. You should see these words now. It says from Hildegard of Bingen. I'm going to read those first two lines. And then I'd like us, all of us, now just imagine that you're hearing, I think we're 30 or 40 people here to, tonight. So let's all just take a deep breath, centering ourselves. And I want you to translate that word of God. If you're uncomfortable with that God, that word God, think about what it is that is greater than us. And just substitute that in our mind's eye. So I'll read the first two lines, then we will. I, God, am in your midst. Whoever knows me can never fail. And all together now. I, God, am in your midst. Whoever knows me can never fail. Not in the heights, not in the depths, nor in the breadths. For I am love, which the vast expanses of ignorance can never still. And this last line is not by Hildegard, but I would like to suggest that this is what we're all about when we really think about it. And so we speak together. May these words benefit us and all those whom our lives touch. So I told you this little story of Hildegard's writing, and now I'll tell you a bit about her creative being so we can get a little bit of a kernel of inspiration this is a woman who, we're not sure if she was five or she was eight, but she was given to the Catholic Church in a manner called oblation. And she was the tenth child. And the tenth child was often given to the church as almost like a tithe. We know this sort of history of tithing in many of the great religions. So a child could be tithed to the church back then in the Benedictine orders. So she was basically deemed to be someone who should be locked away and should meditate for the benefit of humanity and not achieve anything. Now, she lived with a noblewoman when she was young called Jutta, and she actually quite enjoyed it, and she, you know, became a bit of a theologian, got a good education, which is something for that time for women. And sometime later in the 1050s, her teacher had, had left the body, and she found out that she was actually having to leave herself and lead a community of women who were living with men, and she took the big, bold step of actually taking that community of women and breaking away from the men. And let's just imagine the world of 900 years ago and how women were generally treated. And that's a pretty remarkable achievement. And as she did this, she she had this notion and she, would, she actually got a, 
I guess you'd say it's like a vision that talked to her. And it said, oh, fragile one, ash of ash and dust of dust. Um, I am speaking to you. And she had this idea that there was a warming feeling that could come to her and transform her. And she actually wrote of that. And then she composed. In the period of less than 10 years, over 70 pieces of music that are magnificent, absolutely magnificent, one of them being what we would now call the first proto-opera called Ordo Virtutum, the play of the virtues. It's a morality play, saying that all of us have the capacity to choose good or evil at any point. And we have these externalized forces that embody these choices, but actually it is our choice. And so as we go along this journey of being a soul in a body, we come to terms with the fact that that soul, when we start this life, is pure, but we often lose that purity, but yet through the act of conscious choosing, we can bring about that purity again. And this is the creative life of someone from over 900 years ago. And the music is, of course, very beautiful. Now, I say that because I think we can be inspired by the people in the past who embody what we would like to embody. And certainly for me, I first discovered Hildegard's music when I was a music student, and that's you know, quite a long time ago. And I remember the joy I had when I first started learning it and performing it to see the transformative effect it could have on people that I could creatively interpret this music. But yet there was something, for want of a better term, vibrational in this music that could have maybe a more lasting effect than the ephemerality of most, most things that happen. And that led me on my own journey to start thinking about creativity more. Now I'm going to digress now briefly. We've had a little insight into Hildegard. I'm going to speak briefly about neuroscience and creativity because we have a wonderful program at the ANU. Our music students get to do, you know, just imagine getting the joy when you're young of doing this course. It's called Music, Neuroscience and Creativity. And we study the notions of how the brain works. Now, I would personally say that neuroscience is an amazing medium, but let us not be seduced by the mechanism of it. Let us say that there are still many, many things that neuroscientists can't actually you know, say to us. But what they can do is they can follow the neurons that are moving through the body now, which is an astonishing thing. And we have at the ANU a neural coding group that do experiments, and so there's access to machines that do all of those things and look very, very impressive. But what we do in our group is we actually study what happens to us as creative people. And I'm summarizing the literature, so it's very, very quick and reductive. But essentially, when we are five years of age, we are creative. About 98% of people, according to the NASA creativity test, which is still one of the best benchmarks in the world, are creative. By the time we get to 15, 16, that has dropped into the 70s. That's a bit scary. And by the time we get to, well, our stage, I imagine most of us are adults with jobs, possibly with families, stresses. We might even be in that middle stage that is really hard. So our job is stressful. We've got elderly parents and we've got young kids. And at that point, those studies and those methodologies for evaluating creativity, which is often, I'll define how we, do, how we actually look at it in a sec, but the statistic is a little bit scary. It's 2%. So we go from 98% before we start school to 2% creativity when we're out there in the world now, anyone who's suspicious of the modern schooling system could say, I told you so. But at the same time, I'm not saying that we take all our kids out of school because there's so many reasons why we put people into educational institutions and being in that world myself, I can see all the benefits for us because we turn ourselves from, you know, essentially Neanderthals into, into Homo sapiens in, in some sense, that we, we're able to actually evolve very quickly in those so many skills. But this notion of divergent thinking is often lost. And by divergent thinking, I mean being able to think outside of the square, being able to make deep associations. Let me do a test with you. I say good. It's almost impossible for us as adults not to say evil because our minds have been actually schooled into what's called binary oppositional thinking. In other words, we define things through Edward Said's notion of otherness, this idea that whatever something isn't, in other words, we see the world in black and white. We see the world in reductive forms. So if I say good and you say very good, that's a divergent way of thinking. Does that make sense? So we're actually able to say, or someone says good and someone says why. So it, and in order to be divergent in this way, 
uh, the neuroscientists tell us that there is something, and I'd like to draw your attention to a, a writer by the name of Leanne Gabora, who's actually a psychologist but also works in neuroscience, who I find her writing very inspiring. She talks about notions of, um, well, I'll define it as something called the lull. This notion that if we just reach into something immediately and we think we're being creative, that's just like reaching at the top of, you know, the pile of water, and that's pretty interesting. But if we allow ourselves to go into a lull space, which is basically a notion of introversion, we have the potential to access all our memories, gross and subtle, and all the more subtle impressions of ourselves in this life. So it's a feeling that all of us, our totality, can be part of our creative expression. And I can tell you that going through processes to look at this notion of redefining what our creativity is in our creative practice, it can lead to astonishing reversals in a year. It's a bit like those studies when they say, study the brain and after eight weeks of meditation, the, you know, the, the structures of the brain are plastic and they change remarkably quickly. It's not just that we are what we eat, we are what we think. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So that's the, that's the science of why to be creative. And I think we notice that at first we think, oh, the creative people, that's not me, that creative person, that's that writer out there who's written 30 books or that, you know, I'm in music, so there's all these musicians who appear to be just wonderfully creative, right? You know, like you hear someone playing, you know, say a Bach partita on the violin, and you go, this is just so beautiful, how it could not be creative? That person could have spent 40,000 hours practicing Bach, you know, that's the latest research is it's not 10,000 hours to master a musical instrument, that's 40,000 hours, isn't that scary by the way, you know, but that's just an aside. But we get this notion, that might not be particularly creative for that person anymore, they're just so good at it, but of course it can open up the wonders of the universe because the, you know, the music of Bach to me is like actually hearing the, the ticking of the universe, it's just incredible, it's like this is a man is able to actually imagine the inner workings of the mind and all our minds together in music. But that said, what we do does not define our potential for creativity. And I want to say that again, because I don't want anyone to think, I have a job and actually I have to work with numbers. Oh, that's not creative. Let us think just for a second of Einstein. Let us think about what mathematics and creative mathematics actually bring to us. And so many scientists tell us, and I hope there's some scientists here, that they are actually creative beings as well. I work with a lot of scientists and you know at the ANU I get to see our science faculty a lot and I find them just as creative as I am and sometimes way more creative because it seems to me that we all go through a process. Now it might be about writing a piece of music like I do or it might be about literally doing your tax return but we get so far and we get stuck. Have we all had that experience? And it's like, okay, I can do this much. I get a little bit of inspiration and then I don't know what to do. And what we can tend to do is we can doubt ourselves at that point and we can give up or we can continue. Now, one of sort of several things happens. One is we actually become quite controlling and quite conscious. So instead of being divergent, like I mentioned before, we become convergent. And I go, hey, what did I do last time? I can do that again. And that's actually a way... It's not to belittle it because it's a way that we can get bodies of work and thinking that can be quite profound and can move hundreds of thousands of people because we can become almost the same. You know, we can actually, in my field, you can write music that is very, very similar. And many of the great composers in history worked like this. They found what we call the compositional voice or the creative sound. And then they kept writing like it. And, you know, maybe the best example of this is Mozart. Most people they don't need a music degree, they can hear about two bars of Mozart and they can know that is Mozart, even if they don't like classical music. Now, isn't that astonishing? It says that someone can actually find their creative voice and they can communicate it. Now, neuroscientists have also found, now this is pretty, pretty kooky almost, but it has been verified that someone who works in one artistic field uh, can make something in another artistic field and people can see that it's coming from the same person. Isn't that incredible? So it's like we have something in the act of creation that is beyond our physical skill to create. I wanted to really get us all to think about that because it's like we have an idea. Let's imagine that we're visual artists 
I cannot draw in a lifelike manner, I'll never be an artist. Or, I cannot sing in tune like that next person, I'll never be a singer. Let's look at the, the notion of art first. We might ask that question to us, and indeed when we're a kid going to art at you know, primary school, or maybe more likely high school, we're suddenly told for the first time, actually that's not very good, your perspective is all wrong, that this piece is nothing like the great artist I want you to do a piece that's like. But the reality is, if we look at the art that is moving people today, it's often conceptual art, isn't it? So the act of the physical making is a part of it. But some of the great conceptual artists actually now have other people making the physical art for them. I'm thinking of someone like Ai Weiwei, you know, this, this incredible Chinese artist who does things that are, you know, he creates whole ecosystems of art that people come to inhabit. So there's no way one person could do that or they'd make one work every 10 years. So he has teams of people working with him. Now, in my field of music, I often hear people say, look, I can't sing in tune, so I'm not a musician. And if anyone's had that thought, I want to apologize on behalf of all the people who know that's not true, because you can be a musician and not sing in tune. But unfortunately, the way so many of the creative arts are taught is that we're taught that there is a right and wrong. In other words, you have to be convergent in order to play the game right. And then you get the tick of approval. You're one of us, you're in the guild, and now you're a creative being. But where does, where does Leonard Cohen come into that? You know, let's just think of all the people who so-called don't sing in tune, who move thousands of thousands of people. Where does Janis Joplin come into this? this raspy, raspy voice that you would say, you know, if you were to try and cast her to sing in an opera, you know, people would think it was the rite of spring and they'd leave the opera house immediately. But you hear her sing Summertime and it's like the insides of us are scraped and they could become on the outside. And that's because she embodies something that Frederica Gasalla Loca, the really, you know, the poet of the revolution in South America, called the duende, this notion that there's a hidden fire in the soul that can come out through the act of creation. And sometimes it's not pleasant. Something just comes out. And I wanted to say to us, this is what a creative life is about. We can release our traumas through the act of crea creativity, but it can be dangerous. But we can also do something that is maybe even more profound, which is that we can find a very, very good life and we can find that creativity is actually the nexus of our well-being, not the way that we sort of, you know, that we feel maybe a subtle form of addiction. And I want to clarify that in a second, because it's not to say that if we're doing creative acts that we, we are in that sort of space. So... I'm going to get back to that in a second, but I thought, you might not believe me. You know, this is just this guy talking about that. So if it's okay with you, I'm just going to share my screen one more time. And I'm going to share a little bit of just, you know, one of the many projects I've had the absolute joy to do it. And I wanted to give you an idea of something that I think is quite transcendent and also has the potential to move us. And I think this to me is the motivation of why to have a creative life, that hopefully, as Hildegard said, that we can actually find something which the vast expanses of ignorance can never steal inside us. So just bear with me while I share my screen. And, you know, sometimes there's a few things that go wrong when we share our screens. I'm sharing my sound now. And I'm going to go to my desktop so you'll see the slight chaos of my desktop. That's not to say that you can't do wonderful work with uh, any particular type of desktop in the quick time. Let's just listen to a little bit of this. Uh, and it's a really beautiful series of images. So we're just going to, I'm going to ask everyone to take a couple of minutes. Let's straighten the backs out. Let's breathe slowly. And let's experience a little bit of art together.
So, dear friends, apologies for the suddenness of, of ending that. I really wanted to let that run to the point where we saw this notion of taking the leap, because isn't that a beautiful thought? So just a few words about that particular piece of art. That started actually quite quite a long time ago, maybe 12 years ago. Actually, uh, um, maybe even a little bit longer, and Artie will know the exact date, because the idea for this piece of music actually came the day after uh, the, the administrative head and senior teacher of the Brahma Kumaris in Mount Abu in India actually passed away, and that was Dadi Prakash Maniji, who was, for me, probably the most luminous being I've met in my life. And she had a profound effect on me as you know, thousands of other people. So I can say she was, you know, like a golden jewel of a woman. And uh, so I wanted to write something beautiful to sort of celebrate how she touched me as a person when, when, she, when she died. And then a little while later, actually, the Art Gallery of New South Wales contacted me and they were hosting something that was actually at the time at the British Library in the Smithsonian. And it was the Maharaja of Jodhpur's Sacred Art Collection. And it was some of the most beautiful, you know, works of the Mughal period. Um, and they'd never really left India. And it was quite exciting to see them coming. And so I got to write, you know, sort of a major score for this whole collection. But we decided to do a piece called The Cosmos to actually have a sense to think about what it is about uh, India as a mystical place that can actually really move people. And so we looked at, even though the Mughals were, were Muslim, they were very influenced by Advaita Vedanta, this notion of, of non-duality that is such a part of Indian thought, this idea that I can actually get beyond my body and my mind and there is an inherent sense of myself as a soul that is there. And I, I find that personally very moving. So we wrote this piece, well, I wrote this piece for people to literally sit down or lie down in the art gallery. And we had lots and lots of headphone bays so people would actually just put their headphones on and they could lie down or sit down and they could actually just take a break. And it was just such a profound thing because it wasn't setting an individual piece of art, which is what I generally did to that collection when I set art collections, but the idea of the underlying impression of what art can do for us. And then a number of years later, uh, a filmmaker in Australia was making this, this film for a festival we have in Australia where we called the Vivid Festival, and I'm sure you have similar festivals in the UK where you project things onto the major buildings. For us, it's things like the Opera House and Sydney University. And so, you know, we had this, you know, 50-foot high version of these two dancers from the Australian Ballet, you know, doing their, they were set to retire that year. And so this was idea of also celebrating great acts of creativity. And so for me, I thought, this is really what creativity is about, is saying to ourselves that we can actually find a way to, to systematize a way of doing these things. Yep. So uh, what else would I say about this? That all of us, we all have this ability, and I, you know, I must really stress it to us, we might not write a great symphony or the great novel of the world, but in our own lives, we can go through this process. And I feel very, very strongly, there is an old saying that everyone has a novel in them. And I think personally, each of us have a creative expression in us. And the reason why I would strongly encourage us, really all to do this, is that it's first of all, a fountain of wellness and well-being. The second is all of us know and I think this is quite important, and it might be my great delusion, that our intellects only take us so far. Now, if I was to give one simple example, we've just had, you know, a really major, the world's climate change meeting. This is something that affects all of us. The scientists have won the debate, essentially, right? We know that climate change is a man-made phenomenon. We can actually... We can actually look at it, can't we? From the process, the time of industrialization, we can see a meteoric rise. Now, the UK is actually where a lot of the best research is done, and you probably know because it's been a lot in your papers and media, that the ice cores that, that the British Antarctic Survey drill are actually the, the, the best measurements of CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere. So we're able to see this change in human industrialization, please excuse me, very, very clearly through science. But somehow... We have not convinced a lot of people. And I personally think that this is the role of art today, is not just to entertain us. And of course, we all need entertaining. And any of us who've been through a lockdown, how could we not imagine a world of art to get through this? 
you know, like there's no doubt art is needed to entertain and keep us at bay. But yet it's more important than that. We, when we make art or when we think creatively, we are the canaries in the coal mine. So what we are doing, which I think is quite profound, is we're processing all the things that are going wrong in this world and we're trying to make sense of them for others. It's not in an intellectual sense of processing. It's not saying I'm going to read every single paper on a subject and write a summary, although that's a very, very important skill. It's something we do at my university a lot. But it's actually making things that can embody contradictions and enable us to find peace with ourselves. Because when we look at it, even through the prism of climate change, all of us, no matter how nice we are, all of us in this life are contributing to this problem. We might say, I'm doing so-and-so or so-and-so, I'm much better than the person next door. But really, are we better than the person in 1700? And the answer is no. So all of us need to come to terms with our failings as an individual, our failings in our relationships, our failings as a species. Because if, again, how we started our talk today, if we were to zoom out and look at ourselves as a species from a comp point of complete otherness, we would probably see a planet full of vermin, billions and billions of people running around like ants, just doing their thing. And it's not to say that we're, we are like this at all, because each one of our individual lives is perfect as it is. You know, we all have a profound, wonderful journey to make. But my feeling is that there is so much suffering in this world that all of us owe it to ourselves to find a creative response to that suffering both externally and internally. Now, as important as this is, I would say that creativity is part of a continuum of self-awareness. So we can get so far through the act of creativity and it can be, you know, a long, long way. And I'll be finishing up this talk in a couple of minutes, so I'm really interested to hear from people and to get their thoughts on all of this. It takes us so far. My analogy is that creativity and a creative practice and a creative way of living it opens the window to the soul. And we all know this, this phrase. It's a confronting thing to some people to think, am I more than this body? Am I more than the sum of my thoughts, my memories, my impressions, my work, all of this? I would argue personally that I think if I was just to be that, I'd be incredibly depressed for the rest of my life. I'd like to think I'm more than this body. So if I'm to start thinking about this, I need to use my creative practice to start contemplating who am I? It may not make my creative outputs any better. It might even make them worse. But to me, it's the logical continuation of the creative process is to be creative in how we define ourselves, to not be rigid about this, and to allow ourselves to move beyond a limited sense of our journey in this life. So I'm going to quickly summarize today's talk before we, we open up the floor. And I'm looking forward to hearing well reading people's questions and, and also speaking with, with Arti about all of this, I'll summarise by saying that all of us have essentially the same capacity for creativity as a species because we have studied this. The difference between people is not as big as we think. So yes, you could say that the, the brain size of this person is slightly bigger than that one. We can actually study though the brains of creative people and we can see that they are quite different. We don't know for sure if they're born geniuses, but we do know for sure that the majority of people have incredible creative fa facilities when they're young. And by the time they're functioning adults in the world, they're not so creative. And I think all of us know people who lament the loss of creativity in their life, you know, and sadly for many of us, that might be the case in some aspects of our life. Or we might also have the idea that we don't think we're very good at a creative discipline we would like to do. I'm happy to confess that the thing I really like doing that I'm so-called hopeless at is dancing. I, you know, Even though I can write out any rhythm when I hear it, I actually just can't dance in time. So we all have our versions of the things we're not good at. So I just wanted to say, this is normal. And then we move into this notion that we can start to explore the more subtle side of who we are. We can start to be the canary in the coal mine for our society, but also for our inner world. And we can make our life instead of going up and down and up and down, or left and right, left and right, we can start to get into this centering position as time goes on. And a creative practice, if it's combined with a good life, a good life of eating well, 
of sleeping well, of taking exercise, self-care and care for others can literally make us happier than money can buy as long as we've got enough money for a basically comfortable life. Finally, we get to the point where creativity, as good as it is, takes us to the threshold of greatness, which is a knowledge of who we really are, or at least the chance to think about those things. So with that little summary, I wanted to thank all of you, and there's quite a lot of people here, here tonight. I want to thank all of you for taking time out. And, you know, Obviously, we're all very busy people. So for all of you, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done today, and no matter what you're doing in this life, I have no doubt that each of you is a kind, is a generous, is a giving person. I hope that you've been able to take a little bit of rest today and that you'll be able to be refreshed and do many more acts of creativity and also many more acts of goodness in your working, in your personal and in your family lives. So I'd like to finish with the phrase that often are used by the Brahma Kumaris, which I personally find quite beautiful, Om, which of course is in some ways the sound of the universe in movement, and Shanti, I would like to be peaceful with you and I wish you great peace. So thank you everyone for listening to me talk for you know a whole 40 minutes. That's quite a bit of time to listen and I hope that it wasn't too onerous. Thank you again. Thank you, Kim. Wow, you covered so many aspects of um, creativity and inspiration there for us. Um, the first question that's come through is somebody is quoting Michelangelo. And apparently Michelangelo had said, the greater danger for most of us lies not in setting our aim too high and falling short, but in setting our aim too low and achieving our mark. So uh, the question is, how does one set one's aim if we are likely to underestimate ourselves? Mm. You know, Michelangelo is also speaking from some words that are in the Jewish books that, you know, the Talmud, which is, I'm going to paraphrase that each of us is only one step smaller than an angel, but one step larger than an ant. So this is the, the, the conundrum because, uh, you know, we could say in the West, you know, our modern psychological statements say that actually we, we have this real notion of ego to deal with, you know, that, that we can get enamored by our ego and all of us, if we're not careful, could become sociopaths and, you know, just like it's me. But really what we find when we look at ourselves is so many of us are so battered by the life that we've already led that we're barely able to do anything but survive. And it's terrible to think that we're in a point where we have such material comfort, at least in countries like the UK and Australia, we should be able to do anything. But actually we find it harder than ever to have these authentic lives. I agree completely with Michelangelo. But how I think we set the bar higher is to say that it's not about me. As soon as it's about me, it's like I'm the center of the universe and I've got the answers. You know, and so I think a, a creative practice is actually best when it's in service of the world. Now, funnily enough, some of the greatest creative people are complete e egomaniacs. So it's not to say that you're going to be on the path to enlightenment if you take on a creative practice. And as we know, creativity and hedonism is something that does happen a lot as well. But at the same time, for me, I just think it's really profound to think how can we actually be a solver while we are making things rather than a commentator who says what's wrong. And I think that's really, really profound. But the other thing that Michelangelo would teach us is that you just never stop. This is probably the really important bit. What we tend to do in our society now is when, when we get an obstacle, we go, oh, that's too hard. I'd better do something else now. But if we keep going, it's amazing how those obstacles literally dissolve away in front of us. So that's what I would say to us as that great song by Peter Gabriel said, don't give up. Thank you. Um, the next question is, how would you encourage people to be more comfortable with what can appear very uncomfortable um, in their creative process, to get going with their creative practice and let that wonder, weakness and fragility of the self come through without being tripped up by one's ego? 
Now, I want to thank the, the person who's asked this question. I think this is a profound question because it talks about the trap. The great creative trap is to think that we are the source of everything that comes, you know, and, um, and it does lead to so many potential delusions. And also this notion that when people are telling us that we're good, we're good. And when people are telling us that we're bad, we're bad. Because every creative person knows, no matter how inner stable we might be, that when we get that bad review, it's like we're a five-year-old child again and we need to curl up in a ball, no matter what people say. Most people are like that. But this is something that relates very much to my working life, if I can answer that firstly, because, you know, I spend a lot of my time actually supervising people's PhD projects. And I actually, at the moment, it sounds a bit embarrassing, I think I have 13 PhD students, so it's like it's a big thing in my life. And these are the points where often... It's pretty significant musicians come to me and they say, actually, I'm pretty good at what I do. I make a living at it. People think I'm really good, but actually I'm stuck. And I want to actually take three or four years out of my life and remake myself. And in order to do that, I might need to get a little bit worse at something before I get better again. And so we have to go through this process of saying, and yet there's the added danger of writing about yourself in an intellectual voice, because both in the UK and in Australia, when we work in universities creatively, we do this thing called the exegesis, which is to write about our process scholastically. And that, if you're not careful, can dry up the wellspring. But what happens is that when we start to examine things, we can lose that sense of wonder. And we usually start to examine things when they become effortful rather than effortless. Now, I think we can all remember in some creative pursuit that point where we were fearless where things were just natural. And, you know, maybe this is Rousseau's notion of the noble savage as well, that we all have our version of this myth actually held in our, inside us. As we know nowadays, there's really no such thing as a savage, and we're not really that noble either. But at the same time, the mythos is really, really big, that we have a pure sort of inherent heart of us that can just do this stuff. And personally, I love hearing children who are unfettered by musical theory play music because I find such incredible creativity in them. I also find cats are pretty good, and so did Rossini, who you know, wrote the famous cat duet, and many a composer has actually transcribed the sound of an animal on a piano when they've got stuck. So I say that there's simple ways to, to, to solve things. But the real bit is what's in this question, is that uh, you know, discomfort comes out, and we can actually then release things that are not comfortable to us or others. And that can be very, very confronting, first of all. So if that's coming out, we need, we need practices alongside our creative practice to keep us well and to keep us grounded. That's the first point I'd make. So we need to find ways that the journey that goes inside us, if the characters of the novel are speaking to us, they don't take us and we don't become so enamored of their tangential lives that we can't enter our life again. There's no point in having a creative life if we can't go back to our regular life. It seems to be a, a bit of a waste. But at the same time, then... We have this fragility, and it's such a beautiful thing in this, in this question. All of us are fragile. As Sting said, how fragile we are. But as we start to overcome that fragility and get stronger, we have the great temptation, which is to say, look at me. Aren't I great? And all as I can say for that is we have to deal with that because if we don't deal with that, the world solves it for us because all of us are involved in the game of snakes and ladders. And when we define ourselves by external impressions, which is usually what forms the egoic reaction to our creative practice, uh, we are headed for a fall. Whether it's a fall of a bad review, of not making enough money, or often the fall of losing touch of the delicacy of the silver thread that is creative practice. You know, it's amazing when our egos get out of control, how we become derivative. Now, Australia's greatest uh, Western composer was a fellow called Peter Scalfell. He used a term which I find really inspiring called derivation. We know the game is over when we are deriving our work from our previous work. Others might not know it for some time, but we're actually incapable of making something genuinely new, and we're basically rewriting what we already wrote. So I hope that's a, a reasonable answer to what is a profound and actually quite a beautiful question. The next question um, is creativity and self-trust. I find myself having spurts of creativity, but often I then don't trust myself and I seem to have, um, uh, I dip down. 
how do I develop that self-trust? This is another beautiful question. I must say, this is what I remember, Artie, when I came a year ago also to Inner Space, that the quality of the questions, it just shows that you have a community here that is a, really a deep thinking community, and I wanted to really acknowledge that. But trust, it's not just for our creative practice, it's for everything, isn't it? How really do we really trust ourselves in this world? It's like we're so f so fearful of the world, and we're so fearful of potentially the immor immorality of the world, that we lose sense of having absolute faith in our own journey. So I don't feel that we can actually have a process of trusting our creativity until we actually start to really trust the journey of who I am in this life on a deep and profound level. Otherwise, we might develop workarounds and the workaround might be, well, when I don't trust myself, I'll go and write in this manner or I'll go sharpen my pencils. And I can tell you the story of a composer I know who solves this by, before he writes anything, of having a particular ritual of sharpening about 10 pencils and then getting rubbers and getting them completely clean. So it's like the notion of I'm purifying something around me so that I can purify myself in my creative practice. It's quite a beautiful ritual. Personally, I think the notion of trust it relates to the notion of non-stoppingness. And I know that's not a real word, but it's sort of like an active verb. And I really wanted us to have this notion that having a creative life is to say that when things are good, I will create. That when things are bad, I will create. That when I've got enough sleep, I will create. And when I don't have enough sleep, I will create. When someone is mean to me, I'll create. When someone is kind to me, I'll create. So it's actually moving our creative process beyond the duality of day-to-day -day life. Now, that's not easy, but that is the task. And the greatest artists, I don't think they're any better than anyone else. It's just that they're able to do this in more and more of their life, and they build up a body of work. I think what I notice, because I meet so many people who are at the so-called semi-professional level of arts practice, and they often write one or two works that are as good as anyone's, but it's the notion of sustaining that practice that is hard. And so it is about, to me, finding a way to say that whoever I am is good enough, first of all, and then second of all, to say that not everything I make has to be perfect, you know, because we are the worst critics of ourselves, you know, a bit like how we talk. I could finish my talk now and I could be psychoanalyzing the five or six things that I most disliked about what I said, and I could be so full of fear I wouldn't come and do another talk, or I could say, I did my best, I'll get on with my life and have a good rest of the day. We have to make that decision every day of our creative lives. And this is going to be the final question I have for you. Um, the person saying they recently read The Big Magic um, and in it, it talks about genius being um, a gift that's provided from the universe and that we're just channels or instruments for that art to flow through us. So how do we become instruments and how do we become aware of what's available and then channel that out? Um, as a gift to the world. Thank, thank you for this question. I haven't read this, this book, so I don't know it, but this is one of the great myths of the world, and it's a myth that is incredibly empowering and incredibly disempowering, because if we feel we're inside it, it's like we are the, in the inner sanctum of creativity, and if we're not, we can feel like, oh, God, I'd better just give up. But what I would say is the first realisation of a creative life is that there's no way we could consciously control all of our creativity. The whole point is that we're making sense of the world. You know, at the very least, that's the psychological version of creativity. I personally agree with the author of this, this work. That is, we are channels. And there's no doubt that you speak to the people. I think the book was called The Great Magic, but we, we might get that to be put into the chat as well. But yet it seems like, you know, as magical as that is, uh, we can't be magical all the time. You know, so there might be times where that stuff just flows through us. And I can certainly point to times in my life where it's literally flowed effortlessly. But I can also say at times where I've had to work at this the same way someone works at um, going to work at a bank. You know, there are times where you do it. Now, the theories on creativity that are taught, you know, as you know, particularly in the neuroscience area, says that the best way to do this and to, to be this channel 
is to not censor ourselves as we are making. I'm just going to repeat that because it's such a profound thought. As we are making in the initial rush, don't think about the reception, don't think about the grammar or the structures around something. Ride the wave, be a surfer on the surfboard of creativity and just ride the wave till there is no more of the wave. Keep riding the wave and then later when the time is right, that's when we make the meaning, we do the picking and we do the editing. And one of our problems is that we get into editing mode so early in the creative process that we're literally shutting it down just as it's coming for us. So I think that's a part of it, that we have methods, and the method is to trust the act of creation itself and to feel that we, all of us, no matter who we are, no matter what family we were born in, no matter how much money or how little money we have, no matter if we live in a bedsit or a mansion, we have the same, in basically, right and skill set to be creative and this notion of channeling what needs to be channeled through us can be ours. Kim, thank you so much for sharing those insights with us and um, answering the questions in such depth. You've really opened a number of doors and um, insights for us. Kim, we're getting lots of notes um, where people are saying thank you for the inspirational, empowering talk and thank yous coming through. And to the audience, thank you so much for joining us this evening.